Perfect. So hello and welcome everybody to our uh, March Home Dialysis Journal Club. Uh, presenting today will be uh, one of our first year fellows, uh, Dr. Nicole Wyatt. Um, Dr. Wyatt uh, did her undergrad at Auburn University uh, before going to uh, VCOM in Auburn for medical school, and she completed her internal medicine residency at Brookwood Baptist Health uh, before making her way to Nashville, Tennessee, here to join us at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, today, she will be talking to us about a topic that I think is, you know, very interesting to us in light of, you know, the new guidelines coming out uh, from the ISPD on peritonitis and the identification and definition of peritonitis. So we'll be discussing metagenomic next generation sequencing for detecting pathogens from dialysate effluent in PD associated peritonitis. And without further ado, Dr. Wyatt, take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I am Nikki or Nicole Wyatt, and as he said, I am a first year uh, clinical nephrology fellow, and I decided I'd switch it up a little bit with my topic for journal club today and talk about something that um, is kind of going on right now and over the past few years, which is next generation sequencing and its use for um, identification of pathogens and peritoneal effluent. I have no disclosures. Here's our roadmap for today. We'll overview uh, peritonitis and then discuss a little bit about conventional diagnosis of peritonitis, and then introduce some of the new technology that has been coming out over the past one to two decades, and then more recently over the past few years. And then we'll go ahead and get into the study. So I think that most of us are pretty aware of why this is relevant. Peritonitis is one of the most serious complications faced by patients um, that are using PD. It is one of the most common uh, PD-related infections and contributes to increased acute care utilization, technique failure, transfer to hemo, um, and then sometimes even death. On the right side, you can see all of the PD peritonitis outcomes that we are worried about. Um, and the cornerstone of management for our PD peritonitis patients is really early diagnosis and prompt administration of antibiotics. Um, we know that these improve clinical outcomes, reduce treatment failure rate, and then for peritonitis such as like fungal peritonitis, we want to have a prompt removal of the catheter, so this helps with that. We have um, the ISPD peritonitis guidelines, um, which I'm sure we're all aware of. You have to have two of three of these to have a diagnosis of peritonitis. You have uh, clinical and laboratory features for diagnosis. One is clinical features, including abdominal pain, cloudy effluent, and then the dialysis effluent itself, having white blood cells over 100 and PM PMNs over 50%, and then a positive dialysis effluent culture. I like this schema on the left. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay, sorry, I think I was echoing. Uh, I like the schema on the left because it really goes through how we start to divide, looking at the etiology of peritonitis. The gold standard of um, diagnosis is with culture, and we can look at the different organisms that um, we know are common to cause culture-positive peritonitis. And then there's a subset of patients that have culture negative peritonitis, and this is really two different groups. One is where it's culture negative, but it is infectious. And this can happen from recent antibiotic use, maybe some suboptimal sample or culture methods, and then some atypical organisms that are not as easily um, identified on our standard culture. There's also a subset that is non-infectious, and this is looking at eosinophilic peritonitis, um, which we commonly see with asymptomatic patients new to dialysis, and is thought to be likely secondary to a local allergic reaction from components of the fluid or possibly from substances released from the dialysis equipment. This is typically self-limited. Um, and then we also have chemical peritonitis, and we think of this with our patients like that may not tolerate icodextrin, they have very bad abdominal pain, um, and it's really more of a, a chemical peritonitis picture. These will have an increase of white blood cell, but not necessarily a neutrophilic predominance. And then below that goes into kind of further classifying uh, peritonitis with events um, that are associated with it. It's not really our focus of um, discussion today, but I thought that I would keep that in there um, because this, I just really think it's a good representation of the, the flow. 
And here is generally the workflow uh, that we think of when we manage our peritonitis patients. We identify the patients that we have a high clinical suspicion, and then we check the effluent. Um, in general, the guidelines uh, recommend at least two hours for a dwell. And then we can look at the cells in it, gram stain, and then we send it for culture. And going on in the background, if we have a very high clinical suspicion or once we get that initial um, cell count back, we start empiric antibiotics and then can further narrow these after um, the culture results. There is again that subset of culture negative patients and they in general stay on more empiric antibiotics and then we can kind of monitor their, uh, their symptoms and look for resolution, um, but that gets a little bit more hairy as we know. I wanted to mention these two parts of the updated ISPD guidelines from 2022. Um, they recommended that the episodes of peritonitis per patient per year be at less than 0.4, and then also recommended that the percentage of all peritonitis episodes for culture negative peritonitis is less than 15%. We're doing pretty well on the peritonitis rate. There's been data that has shown um, the rate has steadily been decreasing from 0.6 in 1992 to 0.3 in 2019 but not so well um, on culture negative peritonitis. The, uh, the reported um, episodes are kind of all over the board from 13.4% to 40%. But in general, from many of the resources that I looked at, we're using a number of about 20% episodes um, of culture negative peritonitis. So given this need for empiric antibiotics, as well as a high number of culture negative peritonitis events, there have been several novel technologies that are um, in development for one, early detection, and then two, to try to help reduce culture negative rates in PD patients. But in order to appreciate where we are now with the technology, I thought that we would um, go back really quickly about where we have been. So this is just a brief history of culture in general, um, microbial culture in general. In the 1600s, this is when we first proposed that we can actually directly visualize bacteria in the blood. And then in the 1800s, we have early text um, that was published on how to process infected blood. Then in the 1900s is where we really start to get going with blood cultures. We have augers and broths and different collection pr practices in order to be able to identify these bacteria um, initially in the blood, but then further infected later on. In 1951, we have the idea of aerobic and anaerobic collection. And then going a few decades later is when we start to see the first publications of automated detection systems, which is where what leads us today with conventional cultures. This is actually the um, continuous monitoring system that we use at Vanderbilt for our um, conventional cultures. This is blood cultures, peritoneal cultures, pleural fluid cultures, all of that. The cultures are placed into this um, monitoring system, and then there's an automated um, alert that happens when a culture is positive. This culture is pulled for further data retrieval, meaning identification and susceptibilities. Um, and then below here, I just wanted to put this into perspective with the history of PD. We have the first review that was published on in 1950 reporting about perit uh, peritoneal dialysis. And this did report that peritonitis was one of the top causes of death in these patients in 1984. And early 1980s, we have ISPD being created and founded. And then in 2000 is when we have the first consensus on diagnosis and treatment from the ISPD. And then obviously we have the more recent updated guidelines that have evolved through the years. So traditional culture, it's been around for a pretty long time. It's in comparison to uh, the art of infectious disease, I suppose. But um, it is the gold standard, but there are some downsides, namely the time for traditional uh, culture. We know that identification of the microbe can be from one to three days. Susceptibility can be even longer from three to five days. And during this time, patients are generally on empiric antibiotics, which leads to increased cost of therapy, as well as some antibiotic resistance. And then there's the subset of culture negative patients where we already talked about generally recent antibiotic use, maybe suboptimal techniques or atypical organisms. And these are not able to necessarily be cultured on the conventional culture. 
So that leads us to some newer uh, techniques for identification of um, microbes. Specifically, we're talking about molecular-based methods. In the 1970s, we had the development of the Sanger sequencing, also called chain term method, termination method. It was first commercialized in 1986, and it uses a, it's a method of DNA sequencing that involves electrophoresis and is based on the random incorporation of chain terminating um, DNA polymerases or DDNTDs by DNA polymerase. Um, and then this is used by um, a different sequencing technique. It can sequence one DNA fragment at a time, and it was actually how the Human Genome Project was created. And then next, we have these PCR-based approaches. These can identify microorganisms directly from a specimen, and it's faster than the Sanger sequencing. However, they do still rely on primers for identification of a specific target to be amplified and detected. So it's you can only sample or only sequence a small number of pathogens, and it requires a presumptive diagnosis before the test is chosen, meaning we have to be knowing what we're um, looking at or what we're trying to find in order to um, be able to diagnose it. And then we developed next generation sequencing. This was first introduced in 2005, and it's also called massively parallel sequencing or shotgun sequencing. It uses high throughput sequencing methods to process billions, millions to billions, depending on the generation, of nucleic acid fragments simultaneously and independently for unbiased detection. What this means is that we can take a sample, look at up to billions of nucleic acid fragments at the same time, sequence them, and then run them against a library of known um, microbial genomes for diagnosis. So we're, we don't have to know what we're looking for in order to get the identification. This is, can be a lot more rapid. Um, some of the newer sequencing generations they can actually time to from collection to identification is less than six hours in some of these. And then specifically, a type of next generation sequencing is called metagenomic next generation sequencing. This is really looking at sequencing in microorganisms, or that's what we're targeting. So the samples include mixed population of microorganisms, and then it's referenced towards microbe uh, genomes for the identification of what's present and then how much is present. This is the workflow for this metagenomic next generation sequencing. We have the genomic DNA that's extracted and then it's fragmented. There are adapters that are attached for barcoding and then library sequencing preparation. And then the fragments of DNA are simultaneously and independently sequenced by the sequencing um, machines. And then the human related DNA sequences are removed and there's a few different ways that they are, this is done. And then after that happens, what is left, which is a contigs, it's just a long DNA um, stretch that's assembled from shorter overlapping sequences. These are aligned and then put next to a reference database in order to be classified. And that's how we come up with the microbes that are in these samples. Easy. <laughs> Nick, Nikki, it's Tom Gulper. Uh, you actually yeah. sound like you you know <laughs> you, you sound like you know about this. So the uh, the issue will be uh, it, it, it's a six hour procedure. But do you know anything about the destruction of the material if it sits around for a while? And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. The, there are white cells in the effluent that are going after those bacteria. Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns has always been a long delay. Uh, there, there's plenty of infection, but those white cells are really neutralizing the, uh, the bacteria. So my question is more biochemical. Do mm -hmm. you know anything about the, the, the length of time you could delay getting this uh, and still be valid? Is there any, any information on that at all? I did not see any information on it. The Most of the studies, especially in peritoneal fluid, but in general on in other fluids and then blood, these samples were delivered around 30 minutes from collection. Um, the studies that are from the peritoneal fluid are very new, really since like 2019, 2020, 2021. So we don't have a ton 
of information um, regarding that, but I do, that's a great point because I think that our patients are a little bit different than other patients that might have been studied, meaning when we have patients that are septic or bacteremic and they are getting this study done, they're in general in the hospital where it's going to be a quick transport from sample collection to the lab, whereas our patients we can have them take some of their fluid and then come to the lab with it. So it would be more of an outpatient thing. So it's definitely room where I think that it would be very appropriate to study in our patient population, but that's a great point. Um, I did not see anything in the, the extensive search that I saw about the time from collection to processing and if that degradation process would happen. Does that answer the question? The best you could uh, answering it because oh, no. the issue, no, th listen, the issue will be uh, a lot of companies now uh, want antibiotics at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the culturing or, or this procedure is three days after the fact. It's OK right. with me if this is if this is stable material. That's the that's the question. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, OK. Going on to um, the clinical applications, we're talking about infection, um, but really this next generation sequencing is being used in a bunch of different areas. Um, one is with transplant, and I think Young actually did a um, review on cell-free DNA sequencing and rejection. Um, I saw information on heart, lung, and kidney um, studies where they're using this, uh, this sequencing generation in order to predict or I guess monitor allografts for the presence of possible rejection before traditional signs. Uh, it's being used in a lot of different areas in the cancer field. Um, the scope is a little bit too extensive from what we're talking about, but here's just a few of, uh, in, of indications that they're using it when they're looking for genetic mutations or family genetic mutations for counseling. And then also they can use it to look at molecular um, sequencing for appropriate targeted therapy, which is pretty cool. And then when we think of prenatal screening, especially for these trisomies, um, they're using cell-free DNA, which is in both the um, mother and the fetal uh, or the fetus. And cell-free DNA, um, when I say that, it is just, uh, it's all of the um, non-encapsulated DNA that's generally released with cell death. Um, but that's what I mean by cell-free DNA. Okay. Going on to look at where we are with um, looking at this next generation sequencing and infection, we have a study from 2019 that looked at sepsis and they were looking at the positive agreement between next generation sequencing and blood culture in patients that had a sepsis alert. They had a pretty high sensitivity, lower specificity at 63. And then there is a study also from 2019 looking at pneumonia and they were looking at um, next generation uh, sequencing versus traditional cultures. Again, higher sensitivity, lower specificity at 42, although they did take their positive um, next generation sequencing data and then confirmed it with PCR, which raised the specificity to 83. And then there was a larger study, this I believe was out of UC San Francisco, that looked at several different body fluids. And their main question was, we've used this for blood culture, um, data and then have used it looking at pneumonia. Can we use it for other infected body fluids? They did have 12 samples um, of peritone peritoneal fluid, although they did not um, really specify the characteristics of those samples or the patients. It was more grouped in with all of the fluids. <clears throat> they looked at these fluids with gold standard based on clinical judgment, culture, PCR testing versus this next generation sequencing. For the bacterial detection, it was a little bit lower sensitivity than previously uh, studied uh, results have shown. They noted that most of their patients were already on broad spectrum antibiotics when this was started and not as septic. So they thought that maybe it could be from a lower pathogen burden. Um, they had a little bit better specificity with their bacterial detection and their fungal detection. And they noted that this was likely because they used a hybrid technique of two different types of next generation sequencing together. Um, they also were able to identify um, the pathogen in a median, median, median of 50 minutes after starting nanopore sequ sequencing, which is one of the newer sequencing techniques. 
And then they, at the end of it, had five uh, prospectively collected body fluid case studies from patients that had high clinical suspicion for infection, but negative gold standard culture. It was one was CSF, one was retrouterine fluid, one was uh, VAL, and then two were pleural fluid. So none of them were peritoneal fluid, but um, all five of them detected a pathogen while using this next generation sequencing where culture had not. I wanted to touch base really quickly about this study um, before getting into our study. Prior to this one, there was a few earlier studies that demonstrated cell-free DNA um, in peritoneal fluid, but most of these were looking at PCR testing. Uh, they did demonstrate that the cell-free DNA declined in peritoneal fluid with resolution of clinical symptoms and then predicting relapse. Um, but this was the first dedicated study looking at next generation sequencing with peritonitis. This study cohort was from September 2016 to July 2018, evaluated PD fluid for both host cell-free DNA and then microbial cell-free DNA. There were 68 specimens collected from 33 PD patients. Um, the peritonitis group was 17 patients and the non-peritonitis group was 16 patients. Their findings, um, they showed that the host cell-free DNA was significantly higher in the peritonitis group within two days versus the no peritonitis group. The microbial cell-free DNA was higher, but not significantly. Um, and then they demonstrated that the host and microbial cell-free um, DNA concentrations were elevated, diag diagnosed as up to two days, and then subsequently started falling following antibiotic treatment. So they were thinking, this could be used for monitoring responses to treatment. They also showed um, that they were able to analyze a few antibiotic resistant genes present, which is very nice because um, when we're using this sequencing, we don't have the ability to look at sensitivities or susceptibilities like we do with uh, traditional cultures. So this was their answer to that, is maybe we can look at these resistant genes to be able to help target uh, therapy. They found 13 uh, culture-confirmed peritonitis episodes. Um, there were uh, three staph, staph epi, two Klebsiella pneumoniae, uh, one E. coli, one staph hemolyticus, one staph aureus, one acinobacter, um, and then one coag negative staph and one um, strep mitis case. Um, there was five cases of culture-confirmed peritonitis with negative cell-free uh, DNA, which is important because they were noting that in order to get the background DNA out, meaning the human cell-free DNA, they have to do a filtering process. And the problem with that is that you can filter out some of the pathogen DNA if you're not careful. And that showed in this the five, the five cases that were culture-confirmed cell-free DNA negative. Um, there was five culture negative uh, events in four patients with positive cell-free DNA, and then two that were negative culture, negative cell-free DNA. There was a few cases that were uh, interesting that they reported. One was a case with culture positive peritonitis, and then antibiotics were initiated, and then they recultured, and it was negative. They tested cell-free DNA in both of these samples, and it was detected in both samples. So they're thinking this could be used as a adjunct for detection of, um, of pathogens after antibiotics were started. There was a case with a culture negative peritonitis that was empirically treated, but had no improvement in symptoms. Down the road, this patient ended up being found to have cholecystitis, and the culture from the OR was actually the same microbe as the cell-free DNA found. Um, so they were thinking maybe this could detect other intra-abdominal infections. And then there was also a few um, viral and fungal cell-free DNA uh, microbes that were picked up. The fungal was a Saccharomyces. It was observed after a Klebsiella pneumoniae peritonitis. This patient was treated with fluconazole prophylactically, however, still ended up having to have their catheter removed and then due to recurrent peritonitis. Um, there was a few uh, human herpes viruses that were identified, and then also one human CMV virus, or one CMV virus. Um, and the inter interesting part of this one was that it was a patient that was just coming in for a routine checkup. It was a no peritonitis patient, had no clinical symptoms, 
but had CMV detected and they were wondering maybe it was a latent infection versus contamination. Um, those were the, the other besides bacteria and microbes that were picked up. So that leads us to the discussion about the study um, that we're looking at today, which is the application sorry, Nikki, of the, Yes. Nikki, sorry, I'm gonna ask you just a quick question. Um, yeah. I mean, um, I'm not like the smartest person when it comes to this stuff, um, but so in those patients, uh, when they, um, you know, when you were still able to detect the cell-free DNA for the bacteria two days after antibiotic initiation um, were, uh, so that means basically like, you know, when they were able to, they, they were able to identify the DNA, how would that compare to if they just cultured? Like, was anything growing two days after? Oh, they did not report that data. And one of the, the cons of this particular um, study was actually that some of their samples did not have parallel culture. So they had the cell-free DNA, but they didn't necessarily have the follow-up culture for that. So I don't know what the culture was doing at the, at the two days. Yeah, that, the reason, yeah, the reason why I ask, uh, and you know, I mean, we'll, we'll talk more, of course, at the end of the discussion, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you know, um, monitoring response to um, to treatment, right? You can look at the white count and, you know, see that the white count's coming down. And then, you know, that's, you don't have to see uh, the, the bug itself. Um, where this would be very interesting is uh, in patients who already got antibiotics, let's say in the emergency room, before you were able to get the samples for culture and you want to know what is growing, right? Mm -hmm. That would be great. Because most of the time we say, okay, it came back negative, the patient was treated, we're not really going to find out exactly what they were growing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's still potential here, right? This doesn't completely neglect it, right? Because it's still able to, to tell us, um, you know, what's in that fluid. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would say it would be more for pathogen identification, really, rather than response to treatment um, mm -hmm. when you compare it to the cheaper, simpler white blood cell count. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, especially in, if we have the data for patients that were culture negative, but then have a recurrent peritonitis later down the road, that maybe they become culture positive. It would be also cool to see, um, was the cell-free DNA the same, or was the, the sequencing that was done the same for recurrent episodes too? Um, but yes, Absolutely. that would be awesome. Also, also folks who aren't responding to treatment. So I, I completely agree with what you both have said. It'll be the time when I think I would use it is if we put them on empiric antibiotics and then, you know, the cultures are growing, but the cell count isn't really coming down the way we would like. Then you would want to go back and say, so what exactly were the organisms? And as Nikki, the point you made in the beginning, which I think is so important, that the revised guidelines um, just even more strongly emphasize getting those empiric antibiotics on board as quickly as possible, um, make it more likely that you might miss, <laughs> you might miss getting a really good culture. So uh, I, yeah, I think there's going to be a role for this. Yes, absolutely. And you'll see in the, um, in the study that we're about to talk about too, they had a few samples where there was one uh, microbe was cultured, but several different pathogens came up on the, the DNA sequencing. So in the patients that perhaps they are being cultured based on the, or they are being treated based on the first culture, but they're not responding, like you said, maybe there's another pathogen that just wasn't picked up on the first culture. And this could also help in that instance too. Um, so yes, thank you both. That awesome commentary. That was great. Um, okay, so this study, it is a prospective parallel compar comparative study from April of 20 to March of 21, they enrolled their peritonitis patients. So it's just peritonitis patients, no um, non-peritonitis patients based on the ISPD guidelines. And they took the dialysis affluent from these patients. They sent it for traditional culture and then also for next generation sequencing. And then they looked at the positive rate and consistency between the two cultures or the two methods. Inclusion criteria was having peritonitis based on the guidelines, um, older than 18, and then agree to participate. The exclusion criteria was secondary peritonitis caused by GI perforation, which is very specific. Um, and then patients that did not agree to join, and then also chemical peritonitis. So aseptic peritonitis, 
um, less than 50% PMNs, or if we thought that their symptoms would resolve by changing the PD fluid. So more of like a chemical peritonitis picture. For the sample collection, the two samples were taken um, by the, and, and collected per the ISP guidelines, meaning a PD nurse uh, did collect it and then it, the dwell had been in for at least two hours. There was 80 milliliters that were extracted, 50 went for traditional culture, 50 went for next generation sequencing, and then there was no antibiotic use prior to these samples. And this was one of the ones that I believe um, commented on the samples were done within 30, oh yeah, this is my next slide. The samples were done, the cultures were sent within 30 minutes of collection. Um, and then they regarded the culture as positive if there was bacterial growth, negative if it was no growth today after seven days. Here is how they, this is like the standard traditional culture method. Um, you have the dialysis effluent, it was centrifuged for 10 minutes, the supernatant was discarded, and then it was put into these aerobic and anaerobic bottles and then sent to that big machine that I showed earlier, the automated um, uh, culture machine. I can't remember what it's called, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then from there, it was looked at if it was positive or not, and then was pulled for uh, further analysis if it became positive. The next generation sequencing method was a little bit more complicated. Uh, they extracted the DNA and then it was broken down by ultrasound and then went through quality control library and further prepared for sequencing. There's a lot that goes into preparation for sequencing, so I did not put it all in here. Um, but then once sequenced, they were able to remove low quality and short fragments, generally meaning these were human reference uh, uh, sequences they were filtered out, so only what they deemed was high quality sequencing data remained. And then this was compared to four different databases. And you can see the number of species that these databases had in the thousands um, for bacteria, fungi, and viruses, and then 234 for parasites. And then in order to identify what was indicated as a pathogen, they used these different criteria, which were based on prior stories and extensively cited in their paper. But essentially, they deemed that a virus, bacteria, or parasite was pathogenic if the score of pathogenicity was at least 10 times greater than that of any other microbes of the same type um, in the patient. Fungi was five times higher. And then mycobacteria, for mycobacterium tuberculosis, any read that was identified was labeled as pathogenic just because there is extremely low possibility of contamination that's been shown in prior studies. So any, any identification they read as being pathogenic. And then non-tuberculosis mycobacteria was positive. Um, if the number of mapped reads was in the top 10 bacterial list, there was a study that was done at one point that showed this was how they decided to detect if it was pathogenic or not. Uh, they did the generally normal statistical analyses, finding mean um, and then median. They used the SPSS um, statistical packages to perform all of the data manipulation and analyses, and then used a p-value of less than 0.05. So their patients, they screened, ended up screening a total of 40. There was one that had intestinal perforation, which was an exclusion criteria, one that had a, a CFNA, a, a CNA, you know what I'm trying to say, um, peritonitis. And then eight refused to join the study, which left a total of 13 patients that were enrolled. Here are some of the characteristics of the 30 patients. You had 14 females, so close to half. The average age was 51. The um, most common primary disease was actually chronic glomerulonephritis. And then dialysis age on average was 50 months. Here are some white blood cell, hemoglobin, platelets, serum albumin, serum creatinine, CRP data, and then the effluent data, here's the leukocytes, um, and then the PMN cell percentage was 90. And then here is some more results. So they showed that the positive detection rate of the next generation sequencing was significantly higher than that of the traditional culture. They had an 86.6% um, detection rate for the next generation sequencing, versus a 60% of traditional culture for a p-value of 0.039. And here were the results of the, what was positive and negative. There were um, 15 culture positive, next generation sequencing positive patients. 
there were 11 that were culture negative, but had positive next generation sequencing, three that were culture positive, but next generation sequencing negative, and then one that was negative negative. Here are the list of positive um, patients. Of the 15 cases that had both positives, 10 had the same results. Um, most were gram-positive bacteria. We have Staph epi, Enterococcus, Staph hemolyticus, um, a few streps, and then a few E. coli. And then of the remaining cases that were both positive, they had different results. So there was a few cases that had um, strep mitis, but then the next generation sequencing had a different type of strep and then also um, haemophilus. And then there were a few um, cases of enter, uh, E. coli from traditional culture that then next generation sequencing, you can see has a whole list that come up. Um, and then there is a pseudomonas that had different species of pseudom pseudomonas that were found. And then an enterobacter that the next generation sequencing came out as Klebsiella. I also wanted to note that the um, three cases that were positive, but next generation sequencing was negative, it was three strep mitis cases. And they actually went back to look um, at the fluid and these genes were detected in the next generation sequencing. It was just so low that it was listed as background bacteria or background sequencing. So it was not, um, like labeled as a pathogenic um, bacteria when it came up. It was just, it was distinguished as background, back, background sequencing and kind of tossed out with the um, initial analysis. Sorry, Nikki, before, yeah. um, before we move, go to the next slide, mm -hmm. I think I think that's a very interesting point that, that you just raised, right, about the strep mitis. And I was just taking a look real quick through the metagenomic um, column here that you have, I don't see that they identified strep mitis in any of the cases. Yeah. So yeah. I wonder if that's one of those pathogens, like you said, that seems to be routinely um, filtered out mm -hmm. and one that they don't seem to find. I don't know if other studies identified patients that had that specific um, species, right, of bacteria, but mm -hmm. But I think that that's very interesting that it seems to be uh, so far, at least in this study, exclusively strep mitis. That's all. Yeah. Say. Yeah. There was a few other studies that they were able to identify specific bacteria that had accidentally been filtered out. I don't remember any of them being strep mitis, but it has been looked at because that's one of the major pitfalls of this is in order to take out the background information, there is a chance that we're filtering out pathogenic um, microbes. And so there's a lot looking at it. I just don't remember if there's any specific strep mitis, but for this, it is really interesting that it was just that. And probably needs to go through further analytics of why it is just that. Is it having to do with the, the length of fragments or, or what? But, but yeah, it is very interesting. Um, and then of the 12 cases that were culture negative, and had 11 of them were next generation sequencing positive. And you can see the full list over here. Um, we have a few of the common pathogens that we think of, staph epi, some streps, but then there was also a few uncommon pathogens that were detected. Um, there was Burnett coxiella, and then HHB5 and 6, and then actually two cases of mycobacterium. Um, so this kind of brings up the argument of, okay, these Patients were presumed to have peritonitis or cultures negative, but then they also have these um, bacteria that come up and how do we tell if they're pathogenic, not pathogenic or potentially contamination? Um, and then there was one case that was negative for both. So that brings us to our discussion part of this talk. Um, I think that this study has several individual strengths and weaknesses but then also highlights a lot of strengths and weaknesses for next generation uh, sequencing in general. These were some of the strengths and weaknesses that I found of just the study that's not necessarily um, more broad to the sequencing itself. Um, there was small sample size. It was done in China in a single center. There was no control, control group or you know, non-peritonitis group. And then we did see that um, there was those three strep mitis um, cultures that were positive that, that was minimized with uh, background noise when looking at next generation sequencing. 
I thought that um, a strength of the study was having no antibiotics prior to culture testing. It could have also been a weakness if that's what we were looking at, because like we said, it would be interesting to see um, how this plays out in the future with being able to detect bacteria after antibiotics are started. Um, it was very, very nice to have both culture and next generation sequencing to be able to identify and look at. Um, and then this actually had, although it is also on the weakness, but it had fewer um, culture positive, but next generation sequencing negative cases than other studies that I looked at in the past. So they did a good job of filtering out um, background noise while also not taking out the pathogens. Was there any other um, thoughts on other strengths and weaknesses of the study itself that anybody can think of? Did they um, follow uh, response uh, response to treatments, by the way, longitudinally in the study? They did not, no. Um, I think part of what was really interesting about doing this uh, this for our journal club is that there's not a lot of data and the data that we do have is not very comprehensive. Uh, and there's a lot that we can do in the future with looking at this, but this study did not look at that. But the previous study did a little bit, but this one did yeah. not look at it. The, the so, reason why, so sorry, just one second. The reason why I ask is for those that were traditionally culture negative, right, mm -hmm. that came out culture positive with the metagenomic sequencing, it would be mm -hmm. interesting to see which bugs they chose to treat yeah. Right, because for mo most of the time, like you said, when you have the metagenomic sequencing, there's like three bugs right out there. How do you know which one you want to target? Mm -hmm. Right, and then so based on that, and then the response to to the treatments would kind of give you an idea to start thinking about you know what you should uh, be uh, targeting in those cases. Um, and, you know, like what you built, what you had mentioned before, which is, you know, if, you know, you're not able, the peritonitis isn't getting better, then, then you move on to the next bug. But I wonder when they, um, like, you know, when they list the three bugs, are they listing them by uh, which bug had the most to the least fragments present? And then you would treat based on that, right? So. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting to, to um look at. I also, the criteria for deciding what is um, labeled as, you know, pathogenic versus not is very interesting to me. I did not do like a full look back on where that criteria came up from. Um, but it is interesting that like there was, you know, if it's 10 times more copies or five times more copies and that kind of thing. And I'm assuming I didn't look at the specific studies to identify why is that number or not, but it is, it's interesting how there's different um, kind of cutoffs. And if, as we do more of these sequencing studies, if that's going to change based on our findings. So that, uh, I want to make several comments. One, uh, a lot of people quote that uh, the standard of uh, twenty percent culture negative. Uh, if mm -hmm. you it it should your 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 isolation and identification should be higher than that. That mm -hmm. was a figure that we came up with as a committee. Uh, there's no data to that was just an arbitrary cutoff, which is held the test of time. But that's I wanted to point that's arbitrary. And uh, I sent you something from a long time ago that was some of the argument behind that. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask Jaime, uh, uh, when I when I was at RRI, Peter Katanka was very interested in this. And then when, when Nikki quoted a study from right up the street from you guys, uh, are, are you doing this work at uh, at, at Sinai, and are you? Do you know anything more about what's going on over at Rogerson in this same area? Because I, I, Peter was very involved with this, uh, and this is about it was pre-COVID. Do you have any comments? Yeah, no, no, no. This has been going on with Peter Kotanko at RRI and the people of Cornell quite for quite some time. We have not been directly involved with that with Sinai, so I cannot tell you detail, but the fact that nothing has pan out, make me a little bit suspicious that nothing. So I have been hearing this presentation from the Cornell in the fellows night for the past, I mean, uh, six or seven years, 
what is happening here and all that. So I'm a little bit distrustful that this is not going in any specific direction, but I have not been involved to answer to your question. All right, and then, and then my uh, other comment is, uh, so do we know if uh, strep mitis just kind of lives there and, and isn't a pathogen? Uh, any any common or that I think that there can be bacteria in your peritoneal effluent without uh, without peritonitis and and sometimes we get what we we keep calling them false positives when we get cultures uh, for no reason you know that's probably part of the reason we don't want to get cultures for no reason but you've seen it everybody's seen it and I just wonder if they're real and we just deny that. We, we you know we say oh it can't be but maybe there are and that may explain some of this stuff that uh, uh, with this strep mitis. So is, is the question are we are we uh, in incorrectly ignoring strep mitis? Well, I, I, that I don't know, and that, that no. My question is more of a statement. Maybe, maybe there are organisms that are in our peritoneal fluid that don't necessarily cause peritonitis. But in these cases, those patients, right, that Nikki presented, they had they met the ISPD criteria for peritonitis, right, and they didn't really. I mean. I guess my thought process is, and Nikhil, I, I know you have your hand up, so we'll, we'll get to it. But I guess my thought process here is that um, if it's that common, um, why are we not seeing such large numbers of cultures, like our typical cultures, that grow uh, that grow that organism? I mean, I'm not seeing too much of it. I don't know if you know uh, if you, Tom, or Nikhil, or Doctor, or you um, tend to have experience seeing traditional cultures growing that specific organism. Which organism are you talking about? The strep mitis. No, that's not very common. So let let, let me pose the question differently because you're you're zoning in on on strep mitis. How many times have you, uh, your nurses, drawn cultures or your junior doctors drawn cultures when you probably wouldn't have and uh, uh, and they're positive? That's my question. You know, what's going on there? Because we tend to ignore that. We say, oh, no, that's just a mistake. That's contamination. And I'm posing to you, maybe that's not true. Maybe there are organisms there. And it would be interesting to do these studies uh, without active peritonitis. And and th this question of viruses has been on the table for a long time. And this is the first time I'm really seeing a whole bunch of particularly common viruses. You know, so anyway. So maybe maybe Nikki can can refresh our memories. In the study that, that they looked at, Nikki, um, uh, how many patients without, like the one that you mentioned earlier, how many yeah. patients without peritonitis were growing bugs? Because we, we have I'm, a study with that. So, yeah. yeah, that's what I'm looking at here. So this is the one that um, was out no, of No, no, not growing bugs, not growing bugs, but positive. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that, that, that's, what, that's what I meant. That's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, so I, if you look, um, there's the no peritonitis group on the left. Um, and then there was, they looked at a cutoff of uh, of 20 for lower peritonitis. But in the no peritonitis group, it doesn't, the, this triangle is what was culture confirmed. And it doesn't look like there was any um, culture confirmed in the no peritonitis group. There were some microbes that were picked up on cell-free DNA. Um, that's what the the lines are, but the triangles, which look at culture confirmed, there was no culture confirmed in the peritonitis group per this figure. So that tends that to go against the postulation of Dr. Goldberg that there may be organism, which is something that also is attractive to me because now, as you know, the whole concept of the microbiome that is not just in the colon, but there is new information, for example, that the urine normally has almost all the time bacteria that we just don't call urinary infection mm -hmm. with very sensitive. So, I mean, I will not be surprised at all of the concept that there is some flora <laughs> in the peritoneal cavity, mm -hmm. but this mm -hmm. information that you are showing here tends to go against that population. Am I reading it right? 
when you have I mean, no I, apparent peritonitis, I, you don't have too much evidence of bacteria around there. I mean, it, it seems like there is bacteria, but it's not reaching that significance, right? Because we have our cutoff of 20, uh, but there are lines there. It's just that it's been very, very small amounts. No, no, so it's not, you know. Can, can you repeat that again? I mean, because so actually in the no peritonitis group, what percentage of them had any evidence of bacteria whatsoever? Forget about the level. So here, so th that's that What's column that? all the way on the left, uh, Dr. Yu. Yeah, um, I don't so, know how so to that read one, that. Every tell time, me, tell me what is the reading? So every time that there is a line, a gray line, there is um, some amount of bacteria, but you can see at the bottom right, right, that scale. So most of them are, you know, 10 to the power of minus four. So it's a very, very, very small amounts, but there is there is some small amount of bacteria that, that is there. So then that concept of the micro biome in the peritoneal cavity is there. So how many in those without peritonitis? Can you just humor me and tell me how many had any kind of bacteria detected? Can you just answer that? That was none, right, Nikki? Um, yeah, but, there was no culture positive. No, 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 no. Um, we're not talking about culture anymore. We forget about the word culture oh, now. We are talking about this new that's technique. Positive. Let me ask you again. In the group mm -hmm. without peritonitis, in the technique, not of the culture, uh, mm -hmm. how many show any, any, any evidence whatsoever? It doesn't matter the number of bacteria. How many of the yeah. samples? They didn't give a specific number. I could like count all those little lines, um, but they didn't give a specific number. This was the the graph. Each little line is a patient that had. I or, see. Uh, see. So that's I mean? a lot. That's that a, is lot. a lot. I mean, Almost all yeah. of them. Yeah. Almost yeah. Maybe all only them. maybe only like one or two don't have. So you're just Sorry, confirming I'm... the point that Tom was making that there is a microbiome in the peritoneal cavity. It's just a matter of defining. For whatever reason, here they came out with a value above which. But mm -hmm. I can perhaps, if I look and I study the subject, I can come out with any value. So this is fascinating. I didn't know that. Yeah. I think 20 is the standard. I remember that number from uh, the study that we did, Dr. Yu, when we were looking at the effluent, I think 20 seems to be the standard cutoff that, that yeah. we sent. But anyway, yeah. uh, the most number is the same thing as the urinary. What is the urinary tract infection definition that I learned as a medical student? Over 100,000 units per. But it doesn't mean that you cannot have a urinary tract infection with 50,000 or 20,000 or even 10,000. So Absolutely. that is a matter of definition. So I, I that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Osama, Sorry. would you mind if I think that uh, they were, Nikhil had his hand up and I think- Yes, New yeah, Nikhil and Newport. I'm, yeah. I'm, this is a wonderful discussion. I'm curious to know what some of the other folks that are, have what their thoughts are as well. Sorry, Nikhil, uh, sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, no, thanks. This is fascinating. Uh, a few comments and one quick question. Uh, I'll ask the question first. First question is, uh, the culture negative bothers me at 20% quite a bit. Uh, does the paper mention, and I may have missed it, sorry. Does the paper mention that they followed the ISPD recommended microbiological techniques, uh, you know, especially with the timing and the plating and the use of uh, blood culture bottles to, to figure out whether these truly were culture negative or not? Um, and, and Nikki, if you know the answer, you can let me know uh, if, if the paper mentions it. Uh, because when the guidelines came out, we immediately called up our labs to make sure that we are in, in, in Alberta following those guidelines precisely okay. so as we don't have that culture negative number uh, mm -hmm. as, as low as possible we should have. Yeah. I, I think some of these uh, technique positive patients that were culture negative, they, they, they were positive for viruses, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in viruses, obviously, you're not going to see that on the culture. Mm -hmm. I think some mm -hmm. of the beta may be skewed. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a point. I don't know how significant it is to find a virus mm -hmm. in the deep culture, mm -hmm. but they were counting those as if it was, it was technique positive or culture negative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to know if they're pathogenic or is it right. just contamination or could it be they're just there colonizing. Nikki, um, can, can you go to that slide? Uh, can you can you go yeah. to that slide that had I, the HPV? The, Nick, Nikhil, the I'm going to send you uh, uh, some material related to your question. 
okay? Because uh, uh, the guideline is actually wrong. That they resuspended it in the blood culture bottle. I'll send it to you. That that's the, a bad guideline. I'll, I'll I'll explain later. You know, offline. Nikki, yeah. can you go to the slide with the table um, uh, that has like the human papilloma uh, virus? And because I think uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why it's not um, uh, progressing. But, this um, one? Nope. Keep going. Uh, yes. Was this it one. from the first? Okay. This one. Um, yeah, also, this just really quick, they did the study did um, specifically say that they followed the ISPD guidelines for collection. Mm -hmm. That's exactly correct. And you're going to see, I'll send it to you, but uh, Jay Bave uh, uh, has shown that you you, can, you you are not to resuspend it and put it into a back tech bottle. That mm -hmm. you don't want to do that. And that mm -hmm. is what the guide, they are following the guidelines. The guidelines are wrong. I will, anybody who wants, uh, I'll send it to you. I'm going to send it to Shah though. Right. You said uh, nope, it. No for, send it to me too. I want to see. Uh, yeah. Nupur, yeah. I think you had a question or a comment. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Gorber, I would also like to see the guidelines. <laughs> I'd like the suspension. So um, one interesting thing about this is that when we see a couple of times that we get these PD patients for some kind of a procedure or anything, and they complain mm -hmm. of abdominal pain, which is not classical abdominal, like peritonitis abdominal pain. And when we look at the cell count is low, but the culture are positive. So going back to the colonization part, are these the patients we are thinking about that they were colonized and we find these cultures which we call false positive or not related? And so and most of the time it's strep. So I think I mean this genomic technique seems to be very promising, but I think uh, making colonies, the infrastructure and outpatient labs, how to man those outpatient labs with the colonies and the library is going to be a mammoth task. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have. Is that a validated <laughs> cutoff, Osama? Do you know? The cutoff of 20? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've seen that quoted numerous times. I believe that that is the lab uh, cutoff that they use uh, when they're detecting organisms in um, in in the samples. Now I don't know if that's uh, strictly for peritoneal effluent or what's the cutoff for blood, for example. That that I'm honestly not sure. Um, and it is pathogenic. Like, is it? It is. It is a. You know, this is the cutoff where you need to treat the patient versus this mm -hmm. is the cutoff for detection of a. Organism. Yeah, well, yeah, it becomes uh, like, you know, they claim it's a uh, clinically significant once it's above 20. And my first exposure to that was was when I was a fellow, we collected uh, peritoneal uh, dialysate samples uh, and we were looking for COVID, right, virus in it, um, mm -hmm. because we were wondering if we were just spilling, you know, hundreds of liters of peritoneal effluent full of COVID right into the sewage system and um, and potentially just infecting everybody um, from from our patients. And um, the basic science folks who were helping us in terms of the detection process, they were also using 20 as their cutoff uh, when they're and they said below that it's not significant. So, you know, I don't know where that number exactly originated from. I am assuming and hopeful that there is some studies back in the day that showed that that's, you know, that correlates better with perhaps symptoms or onset of infection for patients. But, you know, like, I think, I think, uh, I think the, the point that Dr. Yu made and the point that, you know, we're kind of alluding to now is that, you know, uh, while that may be the cutoff that's used, it doesn't mean that that's a hundred percent at a time going to correlate with clinical presentation. We are going to need much larger sample sizes. And that's yeah. my question is what is the cost? Because we are not going to be able to run the observational studies to really do, um, you know, sensitivity and specificity specificity and correlation with uh, clinical course and which cultures grew out. It's just the number of organisms that are growing out. It, we, there are so many variables involved, you know, how long the catheter is, if they had a prior infection, if it's recurrent or relapsing. And so I don't think we're going to really make sense of this until 
this technique is being used in thousands of patients so that we have a large enough sample to do the observational studies to really look for correlation. I just don't, I think we're just going to have these speculative conversations about, oh, we detected it. Does it matter? How much background noise is there? We're just not going to know until we have much larger sample sizes. And that's really my question is, how much does it cost? And is it going to be worth it to pay for it? Because once it's paid for, then we'll be getting lots and lots of data and we can do the larger studies that are going to be needed to see. And the one other point is that the one part of this that I'll be really interested in, I think that um, I have major, I have concerns about development of resistant organisms and the patterns at a geographical, the regional variation in resistant organisms. Um, I think that this, this technique might be helpful with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, no. To your point about the cost, that is so true. The cost is, I mean, it's pretty significant, although it has been decreasing in recent years as more and more of these sequencing instruments are being available for clinical use. It, we have um, one of the sequencing instruments here at Vandy. It's actually at the um, 100 Oaks Clinical Genomics Lab. And this is all that they're doing right now. So we have one of the instruments. It's not being used for um, infection detection, but um, but they are becoming more and more available. And like you said, as the cost goes down with them becoming more and more available and we can get um, more, more data, I think it'll be a lot easier to make some decisions on, on use for it. But I thought that was cool. We do have, this is what we offer right now through the Vanderbilt Genomics Lab. Yeah, and, and, and one, one uh, last, last thing. Um, there's always going to be variation in, uh, or slight variations at least, in sample collection timing, depending on the situation. I mean, even if you look at our current peritonitis patients, right, what we consider the gold standard in terms of how we diagnose it, right, the conventional way that we do it, there's variations from patient to patient, even within the same institution, right? So, I, and, and I say this too for the fellows, so it, it is unrealistic to expect every single patient everywhere in the world who's being, you know, diagnosed with MGNS is getting it done, right, with this specific time lapse between collection and, you know, and diagnosis, because we don't even do that with our current um, method, right, that, that we have. And like Dr. Goldberg said, even the ISPD recommends a way to do it that may not actually be the right way, right? And, you know, and I'll make sure to circulate that paper to everyone who's on the mailing list, um, as well, um, so we'll make sure that uh, that that gets uh, taken taken care of, uh, and everyone has access to it. But uh, Dr. Fassell's point is the key here, right? So if cost is not a problem, then yes, we can do this for everybody. And access to it is not a problem, then yes, we can do this for everybody because the method alone should not be the limitation, right? And hey, bombard me with all the bugs that you have. Right, and we'll figure it out. I'll take that over getting a bunch of culture negative results and me not knowing what I'm doing. Right, in terms of exactly what I'm treating and all that, especially with um, the rising number of cases uh, of that. And like Dr. Fassell alluded to, you're getting more resistant bugs. We're also pushing for uh, quicker um, treatment with antibiotics, so this can actually be a solution. So there's definitely a lot of positives to this. Uh, as well, it's about making it affordable rather than having it being, you know, the Rolls Royce of peritonitis uh, treatments, right, that only the few can afford to have and implement in their practice. Um, I know we're we're eight minutes over um, and, you know, I think we can probably go on talking for, for you know, 20, 30 more minutes at least, but I want to be mindful of everyone's time. I think this has been a very fruitful conversation. Um, Nikki, uh, fantastic presentation, very engaging. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, on the panel here and everyone who contributed uh, to the discussion. It's been very enlightening and I've learned a lot. Um, so stay tuned to uh, our next Home Dialysis Journal Club uh, next month. And um, so long, everyone. Thank you, everyone.